In the world of unsolved cold cases and mysterious crimes, some stand out as particularly bizarre and off the wall. These are the cases in which all of the elements of the strange and unexplained just come together in such a way as to be almost a divine comedy, leaving us to wonder how this all could happen. And one such case that happened in Australia involves a shark, a severed arm, and a mysterious unsolved murder that is truly one in a million. On April 17, 1935, a man by the name of Albert Hobson and a friend of his were out fishing off the coast of Coogee, which is about five miles south of Sydney, Australia. At some point during it, Albert Hobson caught something on his line. He then proceeded to grab the pole, and as the fish was putting up a decent fight, pulling the drag and bending the rod, Albert kept reeling when he suddenly noticed it was a small shark. The two men were excited about what he had on his line, so he kept fighting the fish to bring it home, when suddenly, out of the depths, another shark that was a 14-foot-long tiger attacked his catch. It was startling, but as luck would have it, a fisherman's dream, so to speak, the two men were overly excited and joyed about this once-in-a-lifetime catch, so then they proceeded to fight it long and hard, finessing the fish adjusting the drag, and taking turns, reeling it in. And eventually, the two men managed to reel the shark in, excited and triumphant in their catch, as it just so happened that Albert's brother was the owner of the nearby aquarium, and considering that the aquarium had been losing business lately, and the fact that the shark was still alive and not harmed, they both had an idea, and wondered if it could be put on exhibit, to draw in customers for his brother. Amazingly, with the weight of the animal, and after a long fight reeling it in, they were able to drag it ashore alive and intact. They then later brought the shark to the aquarium. For the first week, the shark was allegedly placid and acting normally, and was a big draw for the visitors. But then on April 23rd, it began displaying odd behaviors, and by all accounts it suddenly started convulsing, thrashing about and displaying erratic behavior as if it were in great distress. At that point, as the frightened visitors were looking onward, the shark spontaneously vomited up a human arm. They were in total shock. When the arm was fished from the pool, it was found to be a man's left forearm, with a tattoo of two boxers facing each other. And oddly enough, a piece of rope was tied around the wrist of the arm. This was strange and unbelievable in itself, but upon further inspection, Things would only get even more bizarre, and even downright unreal. The arm was found to have been severed, and while the logical conclusion was that it was just simply bitten off by the shark, it was however not the case. But instead of standard bite marks shown in shark attack victims, this particular body part had shown marks of having been roughly hacked off with some sort of object. According to the coroner's office at the time, the victim had already been dead, judging by the marks on the arm. It was also found that it wasn't even the large tiger shark that had the arm inside its belly, but it was rather the smaller shark that the tiger had eaten instead, making the case even more puzzling than it already was. They questioned as to why this arm had been cut off of a dead man, and then later found its way into the shark's stomach, only to subsequently be vomited up in an aquarium tank. After getting the opinions from the coroner's office, the police were soon trying to determine who the victim was. Considering that the fingerprints were still intact and the tattoo was very distinctive, it did not take authorities long to find that the victim had been a shipbuilder, a former boxer, and a small-time criminal, and also a police informant by the name of James Smith. Which interestingly enough, Smith had vanished without trace on April 7th of that month 
and so theories began to come in. There were those who thought he had been killed by the shark, but as with the coroner's reports, insisted that the arm had already been hacked off prior to death. Police soon began to suspect that they had a murder investigation on their hands and that the shark possibly held some answers. The police went back to the aquarium, but much to their dismay, the aquarium had it killed before it could be properly analyzed. Later that evening, the police had it dissected, but after the dissection, there were no further clues left found inside the stomach. They then began looking into the events surrounding Smith's vanishing, and according to Smith's wife, he had gone off on a fishing trip with an unidentified friend right before the disappearance. They then later approached Smith's employer, Reginald Holmes, but upon further investigation, this led to nowhere, and the police were forced to follow some loose leads that Smith had last been seen drinking and playing cards with a man named Patrick Brady on April 7th at the Cecil Hotel in Sydney. A look into Brady's past showed that he was not exactly an upstanding citizen, having been arrested in the past for forging checks, and at the time of this, he was awaiting trial. It was also found that Brady happened to have been renting a cottage in Cronulla, which is located in a suburb of Sydney. With this new information, leading on the tip, police moved in to see if there was anything they could dig up. The cottage was searched thoroughly, and although no sign of struggle or violence could be found, the police did learn from a witness that a mattress and a large tin trunk were seen being dragged from the house. This led police to come up with the possible scenario in which Smith had been killed and dismembered on the mattress, and the remains had been stuffed into the trunk, and then later dumped into the sea, after which the arm floated away and was later eaten by a shark. There was no real evidence of this, and as far-fetched as it seemed, but on a hunch, it was enough for them to interrogate Brady, who was quick to accuse Smith's employer, Reginald Holmes, by saying that they had all been involved in a forgery ring and that maybe he had something to do with Smith's disappearance. When approached about this, Holmes completely denied this, and claimed to have never met Brady before. And with no other sign of the body and no real concrete evidence, police were forced to let Brady and Holmes go, but they still kept a close eye on them afterwards. Just a few days after being released, Holmes apparently tried to kill himself by putting a gun to his head in a boat shed. But this was unsuccessful, when the bullet did not kill him, but merely gave him a superficial wound, and causing him to fall into the water. He limped his way into his speedboat, and took off at a high speed. Alerting the police, this started a chase around the Sydney Harbor. This man, now with a bullet hole in his head, speeding around the harbor with police boats in high pursuit, went on for hours, before Holmes ran out of fuel, and was finally apprehended. After being arrested, Holmes started to claim that someone was out to kill him and had attacked him to try to get out of his predicament. But under further questioning, he would later concede that it had been a self-inflicted wound. He would also come clean to say he not only knew Brady, but also that Brady had killed and dismembered Smith before throwing the remains into the bay. Holmes also claimed that Brady had soon after come to his home, threatening to kill him unless he paid him a large sum of money, which under threat, Holmes eventually did. This was also supported by the testimony of a taxi driver, who claims to have driven Brady away from the scene, and that the man had appeared disheveled, and in an agitated state. With these allegations in place, this was enough for police to re-arrest Brady, and despite a massive search of the area for the rest of Smith's body, nothing could be found, which later on turned out to be a hindrance for the trial, because with only one body part as evidence, and nothing truly linking it to Brady, it was not enough to prove a murder. Making things even more problematic was that the main witness for the prosecution, Reginald Holmes, would later be found shot to death in his car, right before the trial, with no witness and no body, and no established motive, there was nothing really to go off of, and subsequently Brady was acquitted of all charges. After the acquittal, Brady though was later charged and found guilty for forging checks, 
Brady would adamantly deny having anything to do with the murder of James Smith, still proclaiming his innocence all the way up to his death in 1965. So what happened to James Smith? No one knows for sure. And to this day, this would be Australia's most famous and weirdest unsolved mystery of all time, infamously being called the Shark Arm Murder Case. Thanks for watching. Till next time.